to have more than 60 paid researchers, you need a few millions of euro per year. Suddenly you have a very big project, so you need a higher lot. But yeah. then what happens when the project finishes? I don't think failure in research is a problem. Don't uh, underestimate that to make from a good researcher a good entrepreneur is something very different, which is not gifted to, to everything, everyone. Welcome everybody at Beyond the Blend episode 7. Beyond the Blend is a video podcast by Alberts. We are happy to open the doors of our startup and provide you real talk on tech startups. Thank you everybody for all the support so far. If you do us one favor, please click the subscribe button here in YouTube. Leave a like, leave a comment. It helps the algorithm boost us forward. It's Wednesday morning before this goes live. I'm checking in from my home just before I'm driving off to the factory. Today we have a conversation for you lined up with Professor Bram van der Borgt. Uh, Bram is professor in robotics. I love Bram. Uh, he has been the promoter of my PhD and my master thesis way back. Although Bram is still a very young professor, he has been extremely proficient and extremely successful in his career so far. The list is way too long to list all his achievements, but for example, Bram has been awarded an ERC grant, it's the Champions League in Europe of research grants. Uh, Bram was the editor-in-chief of the IEEE uh, magazine of robotics and automation, uh, and he has been an author of numerous articles, numerous papers. He's leading a team of 60 people. He's really one of the leaders in the robotics research worldwide. Um, his lab is in Brussels, uh, and he's also connected to the iMac lab, uh, also here in Belgium. Bram truly is one of the hardest working humans I know. He combines a super high intellect with a strategic mind and an unmet work ethos. You can text him at 2 o'clock at night and you will get a review full of comments of your work back at 3. Of course, not every night, but anyways, just to make the point, he's an amazing talent, but also an amazingly hard worker. As always, we do some updates on Albert's five minutes update. It will be a bit shorter this time. I have a super cool update. The pilot in Bobby Aanland, uh, it's a theme park of Parques Reunidos that I've been talking about last week is going super well. Our station that is installed there, it's a pilot project. So an update on our pilot in Bobby Aanland. Uh, in Bobby Aanland, uh, a theme park here in Belgium, part of the Parques Reunidos group, 50 parks uh, in the US and in Europe. The pilot of the Albert station is going super good. Not only the numbers, we're cranking up more than 60 to 80 smoothies a day, but also on the emotional side. And I want to share one picture with you, which I really, really, really love. Look at here. This is a picture of a girl uh, who uh, decided to get a healthy snack. So she took an Albert's uh, smoothie uh, and she ran to one of the fast food stores she grabbed the straw and then she was enjoying her smoothie uh, together with her dad in the bottom you can see who was enjoying a beer of course life can be fun but anyways it broke our hearts of the team to see that people really enjoy these healthy snacks also when they go for a theme park uh, so thank you very much Parkes Renews for this pilot and I hope we can continue this in the future I truly hope you like this episode we have been talking about many things for example how Elon Musk and Steve Jobs actually should be very thankful for the taxpayers to fund all the fundamental research Bram explained very carefully and very detailed what research is how it is difficult to, re to bridge research from the lab all the way to the industry and how he sees his vision of robots helping us out on a daily basis and what it is for him to be in the position of the life of a professor what are his challenges what is difficult and how can he move forward and how does he see his future it was a super interesting talk thank you very much everybody for watching the t-shirt this week goes to pablo pablo thank you for commenting on uh, youtube for always subscribing and for always being a big fan thank you thank you thank you for everybody who wants to order alberts.be slash merch i'll put it up right here enjoy the podcast see you next week Bye bye Hello everybody, welcome back at Beyond the Blend. Uh, I'm super happy today to have Bram van der Borgt in the podcast. Hello Bram. Hello everyone. Um, Bram, I will give you a little intro of course. Um, you are a professor at the Vrije Universiteit Brussel, the university in Brussels. Uh, you're also a member of IMEC, the Research Institute. Your career is extremely long and fulfilled with milestones already. We will talk about that a bit more later. Uh, but uh, my friend, maybe important to say, you are also, I think I can say that, my mentor from day one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, you were my uh, professor at uh, the VUB for my master thesis and also the promoter of my PhD. So I'm super happy to have you here. Uh, thank you very much for joining. <laughs>
Thank you for inviting me. So, Bram, we're speaking here on this Monday morning. The week is already rushing in. But uh, thank you for uh, making half an hour time to talk uh, together. We can talk for hours, I think. (laughs) But but we have picked out some topics uh, today to touch upon. But I think the first topic, uh, and a very important one maybe, is to ask who is Bram and how did Bram become Professor Robotics Bram? Could you shed some light on that path? (laughs) <laughs> yes, it was never the intention to become professor, although I always liked engineering. Uh, so as a child, I built model planes, but first I had to build a model boat because at least that still floated when something happened wrong. So my mother said, start with the boat, but then I went <laughs> to planes. So I was always interested by everything that moves. And so that was also very logical that I went for uh, mechanical engineering. So. I was pretty sure even as a child to become an engineer. Uh, And then I started at the VUB and had the opportunity to work on my thesis on the biped Lucy. And that's also then that I rolled into robotics. And when I saw pictures as me as a child, I was also always fascinated by all those moving uh, robots. But yeah, never the idea to become professor, but then, after the master thesis, a PhD started, and then a postdoc in Italy, a research day in Italy, uh, in Japan, and then yeah, I was I got the opportunity to become a professor. But my main motivation is to yeah try to change the world and make robots part of our life, not to replace humans, but to assist humans in their daily life and work. Yeah, I still remember the the robot Lucy that you've mentioned. It was in the lab in the corner. Yes, <laughs> and, <laughs> the old <yes>. lady. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I still remember. Maybe we can pop on a picture uh, here in the screen. And I still remember that. <laughs> uh, do you still remember that one day we made the museum in the lab, like all the old <laughs> <laughs> materials <laughs> together? Uh, and is it still in the lab now? No, because it was supposed to move. It's in the IE Experience Center, uh, but yeah. also only the robot, not the... Uh, the treadmill because that was too big to move and yeah also <laughs> nice anecdote the when i had a new girlfriend people were very confused but they thought because they thought that lucy was my girlfriend <laughs> <laughs> working on lucy all the yeah. time <laughs> okay i think i was married with lucy but my her girlfriend was the fashion day <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, sometimes it does feel in the lab that you're married with the lab. Uh, yes, uh, exactly. Very often we've been spending nights and days there. Lot, um, yes. Um, okay, cool. So let's dig it. Uh, there's one topic that we've touched upon in our uh, email prep. Um, so, and I think uh, it would be super nice to dig a little bit into the topic research because research sounds so basic if you're in it already for, let's say, 10 or 20 years like you. But I think f- uh, for many people, it's very fake. So, I mean, if we take a look at the the position of a professor, which you now hold, a professor at a university, I think it's fair to say that there are three big pillars of work that you can handle. Uh, Some focus a lot on education. This is, I think, what many people have in mind for the professor, teaching in front of a class and teaching students on uh, becoming the next generation in a certain field. Uh, But also many professors actually focus on academic positions of leadership. So, for example, becoming the dean of a faculty or becoming the rector of the university uh, or joining a lot of boards and a lot of advisory boards. Um, And then the the third pillar is research. Um, And I think it's fair to say that you dedicate most of your time or you try to dedicate most most of your time on research it's never 100 percent, but i think i don't know maybe you can tell me 80 percent or some yeah it's the majority the reason is that uh i had a prestigious erc european research council grant and then you uh can enroll for a kind of research professorship during which i'm not paid by the faculty anymore by the research council to dedicate indeed most of my time to to research Although I take also quite some positions. I'm, for example, member of the research council of the mm-hmm. university. So indeed, in the university, I have more a research career, both on performing research as on the uh, government on, on research. Although teaching is, of course, still uh, close to my heart, uh, because at our university and in many universities, there has also to be a close link between research and education mm-hmm. and to transfer the latest technologies to the uh, students. Moreover, it's also important to uh, 
yeah, get the good researchers in your lab and to inspire them and to yeah, try to have a balance between uh, students that go further for an industrial career, but also start a PhD. But of course, those researchers they have also, I think, an important role in uh, the economy. So it's not that everyone starting, I think, a PhD should further develop into an academic career. Yeah, indeed. Because maybe also um, bring some clarity in that and most of the people that are in the lab are doing a PhD, which is, um, let's say, the, I think the highest academic degree uh, at some point. I it stops, so, of yeah. course. <laughs> um, <laughs> so so in Belgium, it takes usually four years uh, to yeah. uh, to obtain your PhD. You don't only have to do the time, you also need some results, but that's usually the time frame. Um, <clears throat> And then uh, these PhD students are basically, if you would compare it to a company, are basically, let's say, the, the workforce of the lab uh, that create results that go to new milestones. Um, and indeed, as you say, uh, it is, I mean, many people, I think, underestimate, but as a professor, you want to focus everything on research, but you also need to make sure that you have indeed the team that can actually do that and, and, and also the, the money. Yeah, and uh, so we act a bit like a small SME, uh, although we're not that small in here. We're over 60 paid researchers, so that's not including a master thesis and other students in it. Mm. So yeah, every research group is a kind of SME within a larger company, which is then uh, the university. And we get some funding and because in it from the university, because in return, you do the teaching and those other obligations. Uh -huh. But most of the funding in order to pay your researchers has to come from projects, companies, uh, and other sources of uh, income. And so, yeah, we're kind of running our own little company within the university. Yeah, indeed, because I think that's often from the outside world, not so clear that uh, there is a minimal basic budget where you can pay one or two assistants, maybe. But yeah, in, or exactly. in order to grow to 60 people, which is huge, yeah. I mean, the, the monthly budget for that is, 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 is huge. Yeah, so that means to have more than 60 paid researchers, you need a few millions of euro per year. And mm -hmm. so that comes out of a very diverse set of projects uh, from Europe, from uh, national or uh, regional uh, funding agencies of companies or so different sources of income and that's also a bit a challenge that uh, very often we work in projects and of course they start and then have an end date but that means all the expenses have to be done during that period so we don't have so much saving money in order to cap when we don't have projects so it's always a challenge how you keep the critical mass of your group and how you keep excellent persons in the team. Because suddenly you have a very big project, so you need to hire a lot. But yeah. then what happens when the project finishes? Exactly. And so you need to choose which are the topics you focus on. And so that's why we often focus uh, or develop programs, mm -hmm. uh, a program on exoskeletons, on self-healing robots, uh, and so on. We choose, yeah, we may not choose two diverse set of uh, programs because, yeah, for every program, you need to collect several projects in order to have a critical mass of persons working around that topic. Mm -hmm. And so then you need to sometimes to decide, yeah, if a certain, for example, the bipedal walking robots, after my PhD, we saw that there is not so much economic value uh, in mm -hmm. it, although we see now a lot of no, yeah. humanoids <laughs> and quadrupeds uh, popping up. But at that time, especially in Europe, the funding uh, was not so big. So that's why we turned to other uh, developments. Uh, and so that's always a challenge in what you further invest, uh, being writing proposals, making projects together with companies, what you stop or diminish and which new topics you start. And that's always, yeah. but I think it's a bit similar in like in a company that's also yeah. there, you continuously need to uh, be vigilant, uh, what are the new trends and what are the new products? But for us, we don't sell uh, products or services. We sell research. Uh, yeah. And that's, uh, yeah, the I think quite similar, which is not always envisioned like that by people outside the university. No, indeed. And I think something which is very much underestimated is this, let's say, moral obligation you have uh, to have a 
to, for a student, if you say you motivate somebody, you say, hey, join the lab and <clears throat> let's start a PhD in a certain topic, whatever it might be, you somehow have the moral obligation to be able to pay that person for the next four years. Because if all of a sudden your funding dries up, yeah, I mean, it's not like you can promise somebody that the lab will do fine, but you somehow have that moral obligation. Is that not hard to balance uh, these, these tracks? Yeah, it's not only a moral obligation, it's also a legal obligation. When we start okay. the PhD, a bursary, we need to have at least for four years money for that person. Ah, but okay. To give you an idea, for example, often European projects are three years and mm -hmm. three years, and often other projects are only two years. Yeah. And of course, it's sometimes challenging to foresee, of course, especially because the acceptance ratios of, for example, European projects is only a few percent that you will get enough projects to continue. Yeah. On the other hand, you should also take enough risks uh, to hire talent, uh, because otherwise, of course, uh, when you have a project, you don't have the people to execute it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that's uh, a challenge. Uh, but I think also there, the war of on talent is, it's, it's especially big. in engineering and, and, uh, and innovation and technology is, is big. And so, yeah, it's... Uh, uh, a challenge, of course, to to develop such a team around it. Yeah, because I don't know if the parallel is 100% correct, but I think at least <laughs> in some way, I think in the end, what, what you're running is an SME that is providing, exactly. is providing services to society. Your end customer is actually yeah. society. And the economy, of course. Uh, exactly. And that can spin off in the economy uh, for people then towards products, because we are... I mean, we were talking before about Lucy, which was a bipedal robot walking that you invented together uh, with, with the colleagues a long time ago. But now, actually, like you said, now all of a sudden you have Elon Musk with Tesla who are actually building um, a, a robot, a bipedal robot. Nobody saw it yet, but at least they say they are. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he said that this year there would be still a reveal. So he still has six months, uh, four months, sorry. Um, yeah, but so that is 20 years later. So somehow yeah, you have and to people look need into to the aware future. of that. Yes, that that is developing the technology readiness uh, level. Eh? So uh, often we see uh, as the big innovators, as uh, Steve Jobs, or uh, we talked about Elon Musk. Mm -hmm. But if you see to the core technologies that, for example, are in uh, uh, the iPhone, mm -hmm. yeah, all those technologies are the internet, uh, touch screens, batteries, uh, GPS. Uh, all these techno basic technologies are grounded in government-funded uh, projects. And so that are, is an idea eh? how to, for example, connect all computers in the world or how to develop mm -hmm. that you can also touch a screen. That is a very new idea. So that means it's very low on the technology readiness level. At that moment, it's an idea. Mm -hmm. And then typically, because those projects are so high risk, typically... Uh, companies uh, don't want to pay want. Uh, for yeah. uh, and so that is then developed into something that's going to a lab, a lab demonstrator which has often very big limitations uh, but then uh, yeah, the technology evolve, has to evolve further into a market, a, com a product uh, uh, prototype and of mm -hmm. course bring all those technologies together and developing something amazing as the iPhone, for example. Yeah, yeah that's, I think, the role of the company. Uh, yes. And that also means that, for example, eh, what happened with BlackBerry, similar technology team, but that didn't become such, Ali, in the beginning was a success, eh, but didn't that. innovate enough. Have it, for example, touch screens uh, and so on. And that became a big uh, failure. But people have to realize that it takes a very long time for it. And eh, now, Elon Musk is developing reusable rockets. It's a big mm -hmm. innovation. But yeah, the development of it goes back to World War Way II. Uh, Way also the vision of driverless cars. Uh, most of the companies, most of the brands with, of course, Elon Musk on top, that <laughs> every year says that the robot taxis will be ready. Uh, yeah, I don't know where that people realize, but do you know when for the first time with almost 98% of driving driverless, from the West Coast to the East Coast in the United States was done. It was no. 1995, <laughs> so <What? laughs> more, <laughs> almost 30 years ago. Uh, so people underestimate that, yeah, uh, technology is not coming uh, like that. And it's a very long time before 
technology is developed. Moreover, we are talking here about hardware often, mm-hmm. where compared to software, of course, it can uh, multiply and grow, of course, much faster. Which has a reason that often the underlying uh, hardware already exists. And for example, mm-hmm. during the Corona crisis, we went disruptive digital. Uh, yeah. But the reason was that we had a uh, very fast internet connection already late down. Everyone yeah. had computers and and reliable uh, airpods and, and all. Imagine that it happened 20 years ago, then we wouldn't have had uh, this disruption. And of course, uh, also with the corona vaccination, eh, a lot of anti vectors said, yeah, look how fast they were developed. It must be mm-hmm. impossible that they work and so on. But they, I think they forgot that also all the underlying technologies were already for decades under development, and then a yeah. new corona virus came with a particular uh, uh, structure uh, in it, in the RNA and so on. But yeah, a lot of tools in order to develop such a vaccination and other tools, yeah, were already developed. Uh, Way before. And, huh? and that made uh, that it's such a fast pace uh, possible. Yeah, yeah. And of course, high low TRL means extremely high risks. Uh, mm. So failure is uh, part of it. Uh, mm. And I think that we need to be better. Uh, typically, companies, but also universities, only show what is going very well. But what we learn from our failures, and often we That's keep fun. that hidden or only hidden in the lab. Uh, but I think we need to find a way that also others can learn from it. And so others can also... Uh, yeah, avoid to do the same mistakes or at least do different. And of course, yeah. uh, to again show with Musk, uh, his failures are very public. You cannot hide <laughs> the explosion they of a explode. rocket. <laughs> <laughs> That's almost uh, awful time. Uh, but it's part of his innovation strategy uh, to fail uh, a lot. But also, of course, you need to learn a lot between uh, the different uh, failures. And I think uh, now don't... Uh, people sometimes say, yeah, it's uh, a lot of money that is wasted there. And I think part of it's true because uh, mm-hmm. it's a high risk and we need to agree that to have very big successes, that there are also has a lot that had to go uh, wrong. And of course, when the government invested in it, we need to also understand that it's part of, of the way research is done. But yeah. sometimes I think we now focus a lot that from the very beginning, for the very low TRL research, at least in our projects, we already need to develop a whole business plan and strategies yes. to further develop it. But a lot of uh, innovations are made without a clear question why is it needed. And uh, yeah. one of the most example is the, the laser. Very cool, but what shall we do with it? And only the the applications, what to do with the laser, and now I think everywhere is light technology, which is, uh, of course, using laser. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, we use it for space, uh, for communication, for measurements. Uh, a lot of solutions exist from it, and that's sometimes also the criticism that Nobel Prize winners give. Yeah, the climate change so much uh, that you directly need economical value, that's when I had to do my innovation now, it's, yeah, that it would be largely impossible. Yeah, exactly. Because <clears throat> we touched upon it already a little bit with uh, projects and grants. Based, and then also the output I want to slowly tu- uh, uh, softly touch because what you say I think is really true and it's a bit the theme of the podcast also, even <laughs> unprepared in this mm-hmm. case. Uh, we try to show a little bit more like what are we doing and where are we struggling or what is going slow. We do that gradually, of course, but we try to find that platform. And actually that platform is indeed, even in the research world, less and less existing because the beginning of, of let's say, a um, research track uh, to get funding is a project proposal, which you write and where you have to promise, let's say, the world of change and how it's going to be amazing. And then the end often is academic papers. So these are articles six pages, 10 pages or more, where uh, researchers write their results with the idea to contribute to the research community so that others can pick up from these results and continue further and can start uh, working on it. But there are very little papers that have the title, how we failed with our new laser. 
No, exactly. It's almost always that's a huge challenge. Yeah, it's almost always new. It's always or has something new, or even to go eh, not only what it feels, but also, for example, eh, we try now eh, we we develop IP on, for example, the self feeling materials we develop because we want to go to a spin off company of it, but mm -hmm. we want that. Many other researchers start to experiment with our materials, eh, with the cellar feeling, because now almost nobody else has access to those materials, only we. But we want that more applications than what we can develop. Eh, we want to create an ecosystem around it. But so we wrote a tutorial paper how to use those materials, and it was also rejected because there was no innovation in it. Yeah, the goal. So and the innovation is not those new materials because they're patented and we wrote uh, articles about it, but we want, look, this is the procedures mm -hmm. that you can start to use those materials. And so even that is not accepted. And so what I find in engineering, because it's typically more in engineering, uh, it's less in social sciences and medical sciences, mm -hmm. that what someone else wrote in a publication and improve that, mm -hmm. make it reproducible, yeah, that's not yet a lot in our uh, culture, uh, which is very needed in order to make it more mature and to improve the TRL level uh, of it. And that's also often in grant writing uh, that they often ask, yeah, what is new uh, mm. in it? And so I don't always think that we need to have a lot of novelty in it. We also need further uh, funding in it to further mature the technology, because at a certain problem, the scientific novelty is, is done. Hey, for example, on the cell field material, yep. hey, we have those materials, but for investors, they're still too high risk. Yep. Can they be used in real applications? Not yet, uh, because it's still lab scale and not mm. based on the requirements of the companies. Uh, and so you need to cross between TRL3, which is a lab demonstration, and uh, 6, 7, which is field test, and then a commercial product is 9, and that's production. Uh, that's uh, going up. Uh, just producing it. And so that's the value of death. Uh, so how you cross it, and I think there also a lot more efficiency can be developed, uh, that, yeah, we need to link what the research world does and what companies need that that value has to be closed. Yes. And so there are a lot of uh, my friends focusing on it, but it's often still uh, a contradiction that they decide, yeah, what's novel in it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, all the technologies are, are there in the lab, but to bring something from the lab to the real world, still a lot of challenges has to be overcome. And so you need a transfer of this, this technology and that's how we need to co collaborate. Yep. And that can be, if there is a company there that is interested in it, yeah, then it's the transfer of the, it's the knowledge. If that company doesn't exist, yeah, then it's developing a new uh, company and that's often uh, a spin-off when it comes yep. out of uh, technology from university. Uh, like, for example, our uh, prosthetic feet, uh, Axilis Bionics. So the company is founded in 2019. Mm -hmm. where already 10, 15 years of research uh, was behind it. And still, uh, they're now launching their first product. So mm -hmm. it took a lot of time because, yeah, it's a medical product. So you need all the certification. It needs to be reliable. It has to work more than for the video or the graphs we mm -hmm. make in our lab. It has to work for four months. Uh, and so all the things has to be in place in order to make a product out of it. Moreover, robotics is something that integrates a lot of technologies and it's not that you can hide one that doesn't work. No, everything has to work in order yes. to make the product. And the same with Albert said, that's not out of a lab where hey, you develop it yourself, but it's all a whole uh, from an idea on the robotics smoothie. I still yeah. remember when you mentioned in the lab <laughs> to have reliable uh, machines. Uh, that's uh, crazy in all the different companies and organizations where you push a button or you order it from the phone. Mm -hmm. And that takes uh, a while, especially because it's hard there. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think that valley, a valley of, of that, maybe even that you've described between the industry and between academia, 
Uh, if I push back a little bit, uh, or which you often hear is like, you know, uh, in research, there's so much money wasted and we go into random directions. Um, uh, the efficiency is not high enough. Uh, often they typically say in a company, there is pressure, there is uh, market driven. So people at least go forward and university, it's all way too relaxed. How do you see that stress point? Because we, I'm today I'm 10% postdoc so that means after the phd the position uh, that you can still have in the lab to continue basically your career so i'm 10 percent exactly with that focus how to bridge to industry and honestly i find it super hard because many of these projects if we're really honest the companies and the research institutes it almost feels like one is speaking chinese and the other is speaking english you know like uh, some think why are you now doing this and other think why don't you why don't you like this i often really find in these projects that it is inefficient. I really find it that I think, oh my God, is everybody thinking in the same direction here or what do actually the people want? But then somehow still at the end, something comes out. And then there is one of the partners of the industry that says, oh, we're actually going to use this maybe in this or this way, although it can still take four years before it then actually really somehow happens. How do you feel about that That stress level? Because you are doing your own spin-off companies, but you're also working a lot with the real uh, industry world, which is already there, right? Yeah, I think that uh, it's challenging not only to work with companies and so on, but also with other disciplines, which I also find very mm. important. And I think there, uh, it's typically that in the beginning, it's uh, slow because you need to get to know each other. And you need to get over that period, but once the researchers uh, start to know each other uh, and the people, then I think the speed can increase. But I think because sometimes such projects are often, yeah, one or two years, it's probably often too short mm -hmm. in order to have a long time uh, transfer of technology. Uh, and so that's also, of course, working together with different researchers. Uh, like, for example, we work together with the material scientists, the sociologists, and so on. Yeah, there the collaboration is already for a very uh, long time. But typically, uh, projects, uh, yeah, they, they ask what I said before, have very novel ideas, but you still need to apply it in a real setting. So yeah. that's already the contradiction. And moreover, yeah, it's often uh, icon projects, uh, which are those typically collaborative projects, it's two years. So mm -hmm. I think uh, there we really need to go to, to longer collaborations between the different companies and also allow that, yeah, always this novelty is not requested, but more important, the transfer of this IP True. and that you uh, uh, see who does what in this value chain to say from base or TRL, a ladder from basic research to, to applied uh, uh, research. And, and yeah, there I think um, also for risk uh, investors that they, if I see the role, eh, often the government is seen as, as not uh, very mm. innovative. Uh, on the other hand, uh, they're also one of the best uh, biggest risk investors eh? because 100%. all the basic T, uh, low TRL research is government funded, but I also find it that it's often they go pretty high in the TRL level in order to, uh, to still fund, uh, uh, the research. Mm -hmm. While I think in other, uh, countries, yeah, risk investors take a much more risk and maybe even in the United States that they already sell a dream, so very low TRL, yeah. and have challenges then to develop uh, the TRL uh, level. So also there, I think we have to, to find a balance, but I also think then um, we need to uh, understand, and that's what I find a bit um, cruel when very big companies, but because I don't think that's possible for SMEs, but mm -hmm. like, uh, yeah, those big ones, that they find all the ways to avoid paying taxes. Yes, exactly, exactly. Because well, all they, their... uh, first of all, they need highly trained staff. Uh, and yeah, who does the education for it? The government pays for that. Moreover, they need the innovation for it. And typically in times of uh, economic crisis, the government yeah, starts to focus on mostly innovation. So pay a lot, have, uh, 
to do those high CRL uh, projects. And then they try to uh, often forget the basic research. Of course, because, yeah, the short-term return on investment oh. is much bigger. Uh, uh, but of course, you need, if you don't have research that also starts low, at the low TRL, yeah, after a while, you cannot innovate yes. enough anymore because you didn't invest enough in your uh, basic research. So it, I think also for the government, we need to see and that there is a balance in funding over the TRL, eh? but also that you allow uh, universities and companies to to have, yeah, from the ID and to see what is the role of all the partners in all the different steps. Because I think the inefficiency is that valuable research ends up on the shelf and ends up only in a paper and it is not further transferred uh, to the companies in it, because I don't think failure in research is a problem, but what to do with both the failures as the successes, how the companies, but also society can pick them up and, and, and use this uh, insight. Yes. <clears throat> yes, definitely. Because like you say, the, the government is actually taking often a very risky role in all of exactly. these endeavors. I mean, and that's, <laughs> even for companies, again, yes. when we're, talking about Musk, <laughs> a lot of their income is again the co government from asking hey, send me to the is this some rockets and some yes. astronauts to for example yeah my tesla which is also big part subsidized by the government and in order to make that transition possible yeah it's also counting on government projects exactly. and some fail and, and others are successful uh, yeah, no, definitely. And even on the very small level, uh, like we do with Alberts, the, um, many startup founders are very proud about, uh, you see it on LinkedIn, eh? oh, the, I, I've raised that much million from that investor, or I don't know what, but I'm not, uh, I'm not afraid or shy to say that the first entity or the first signature under Alberts was the government. Because exactly, the government... Yes. The government gave us a grant uh, here in Belgium. It's uh, called, or in Flanders, it's called Vlajo. It is an innovation project. So they signed that deal that back in the days, it was 250,000 euros under strict conditions that we would find additional funding, which we didn't have yet. So of course, then with that uh, deal, so we didn't have the money yet, but we had that agreement. We could then go towards investors and say, hey, look, we have a starting budget under the condition that you can also co-invest. But the first signature was the government. Exactly. It and was often the government. first signature is in university and even yeah, also Axelis Bionics, a big part of the funding to bring it to the market is the government at that time, not uh, Vlajo, the Flemish, but uh, the Brussels government, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Viris that uh, funded and which is crucial for the development of the company. Yeah, no, definitely. Definitely, I think. So how do we conclude then that Elon Musk should be thankful to the government? <laughs> Indeed. And, and, and he also, of course, uh, also there, he has a big vision and, and I appreciate a lot what he does, although he also does very, uh, things which I don't uh, agree. Mm. But I think it's also part that he also is in an ecosystem with talented persons. Uh, of course, he gives also probably its possibility to the, do those innovations within the companies. And what I mm. appreciate a lot is he really dares to innovate yes. and because we see the car, for example, but what is under the hood innovated, mm. I find it often even more impressive mm. uh, than only the fact of an electric car. Mm. And for example, he, he kills quite a lot of robots with his new uh, Giga presses, for example. Mm. So yeah. Typically, how a body is made, eh? you, you, you stamp all the parts and then you have hundreds of robots gluing and welding and bringing all those parts together. And he, he just threw away a lot of those industrial robots and yeah. placed it together with huge uh, die cost uh, machines, yeah. which is a huge risk. Uh, yeah, yeah. But yeah, that's why he can make such a uh, uh, big uh, profit on his car. But in order to do that, he had to take uh, huge, uh, uh, huge risks, risks, uh, of huge it. risks, and and so the the innovation there is not 
only in the design. Uh, but he often says, yeah, designs are overrated and manufacturing yes. is underrated. And so I also think that we, in, 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 uh, in Belgium or in Europe, we further need to develop it. And that's why I always appreciated your work that you not only thought of, yeah, how to make better machines and to do the AI and the apps around it, but also started already to looking much further what, how can I use robots in it? Oh. In an ISME, which, yeah, was it's surviving to, to bring the machines uh, uh, produced, but you are already thinking, how can I deassemble the parts? How I can I make it much more modular? How I can bring robots in it? And that, of course, are the different projects which, for example, Flanders make. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, you, you're also thinking about that. And that is, of course, much less feasible to the client. Uh, that buys the machine, but it's, I think, as important for the further development and the innovation in, in, in our region. Yes, and then unfortunately it goes step by step eh, because right after this call, if I click stop record, I will jump into the car to where we produce the machines now and it's fully done by hand. Exactly. <laughs> so yes. it, it takes a very two-sided uh, mind maybe to try to think, okay, how can that one day be? And then join projects together with your team and together funded them by Flanders Make, again, a governmental institute that is funded uh, largely by the government to think how can we one day do that? But then at the same time, try to really do it with uh, the team of Alberts, um, literally by hand and our partner, Dekimo. So, yes, I hope we can do this call again in one year and say the first robot yeah. is included in our production. <laughs> Let's make a promise on that. Okay, I see that uh, we can do this for hours, but we know each other very well. Um, but uh, maybe to uh, start rounding off. I just want to ask you a question that I never asked you that actually. <laughs> so I'm, I'm honestly curious what you'll answer. So I think you are, you have learned me how important it is to plan ahead long time in time. Uh, I don't know if you realize that, but you, you really can see a student and say, okay, what type of personality is that? What type of, let's say, skill set is in there and how can we start? career planning, not how will he retire, but at least how will the next five years be or where can he or she grow towards. Um, so I'm super happy you gave me all this freedom to start exploring with Alberts and do all, all these kind of stuff. But if it's okay, I put a mirror, <laughs> a mirror on the screen and I ask, where is your journey going? Because as a professor, you have reached so many milestones already. Of course, there is always more, but I'm just curious to tap a little bit into your mind. How do you see the next 10 years and what is maybe a wild dream that's still in your head? Yeah, uh, it's of course, yeah, we always uh, think ahead, but sometimes they probably also know uh, at the VEB, we lost our two pro-rectors and it had yes. a, yeah, was close to them. And that also realized, yeah, life is not uh, forever. Uh, mm -hmm. And yeah, how to balance to stay healthy. I have the family time and we have both uh, kids and, uh, and, and also the work. So how to balance those. But I think... Uh, yeah, I hope to steal my dream. It, there is not that we have everywhere robots at the, the moment and also everywhere robots for the common uh, good that do uh, good. So there is still, I think, quite some work on it. And also what I, I mentioned, yeah, I really want that those robots uh, end up in a society and that is not only focusing on, on new papers and try to have science and, uh, and nature papers, which I almost... Uh, no have we have the science robotics paper on the cell of feeding, but also yeah, cool. yeah uh, try to develop into them into companies and that's also why I'm very proud of the uh, the researchers in our group like you but also Pierre and others that dare to go not say I, I will go for an academic career but uh, try to change uh, the the world literally by starting a company bring those research into reality because don't uh, underestimate that to make from a good researcher a good entrepreneur is something very different which is not gifted to to everything everyone and so yeah it's a whole process that people have to pass in order to from selling their research to sell mm -hmm. yeah products uh, and so yeah for my career i hope i can further uh, contribute uh, to that and also, yeah, for me, there are a lot of societal challenges. And so the sustainable development goals, the e green deal are for me 
very important, which I try to do in my personal life. Eh? For me, the, the challenge on climate and, and, and energy and, and now water are for me very important, which I want to do in my house and in my family. But in my work, eh, also there, the SDGs are important. And that's why how we can marry economical needs uh, with societal needs and how we can bring a balance uh, between them, between profit and also uh, societal uh, benefit. And yeah, it should not be go one, like for example, uh, Facebook, which is a economic huge thing, but we see that the, the societal dramas along with it, with privacy, wow. uh, women and so on are, are, are large uh, politics. Uh, Mm -hmm. And so how to find balances between those. And I think that's also a bit the role of the universities and especially at the VEB had to keep that in balance and to develop technology for the common good. Uh, it's a challenge, but I think also a huge opportunity. And what I like a lot is to work together with a lot of these different disciplines, yes. people in, with different uh, aims. Uh, not everyone needs to become an entrepreneur, but can also have other roles. Uh, in society after leaving our uh, lab. So that's uh, when we can further realize that and I would be ha happily <laughs> go becoming older. Yes, Bram, you do that fantastic, really. <laughs> certainly that certainly that cross industry and everything you are. Yeah, there were many forces that have made the lab big, of course, uh, Dirk contributed massively already longer, the uh, other professor in the lab, but I think it's fair to say that you really dare to go to other disciplines, other research directions, uh, uh, get other labs involved, make this whole robotics ID, which is the connected university yeah. around robotics, go to beyond to write Homo Roboticus books so that people can really understand how can these disciplines work together. So really, it's, uh, it has been a very fun 10 years uh, joining yes. your path. And that's why I also joined uh, IMEC in order to see how those new nanotechnologies that they develop can also have benefits in our case and in uh, robotics. Yeah. Yes. Good. Okay. Let's then conclude maybe uh, again with Elon, the future can be bright. So let's build it together. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Okay. Ram, thank you. Thank you very much. Enjoy the uh, rest of your day. Thank you very much. This was yeah, fun. Bye-bye. Thank okay, you. Okay. Bye-bye.